So let's continue with this discussion of some of the problems on Legendre polynomials. And here in the slide, you see a whole bunch of them. And I explained to you how to go about doing some of these things using orthogonality, normalization, Roderick's formula, and a three-term recursion formula. These four things are at your disposal. Let's take the first one, Pn prime of 1 equal to 1 half of n into n plus 1. Let's use the Roderick's formula to compute this. What's the Roderick's formula again? It is 1 upon 2 to the power n n factorial times the nth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the power n and I'm differentiating again. So it is n plus first derivative of x minus 1 to the power n into x plus 1 to the power n as you see displayed in the slide. I have to use the Leibniz rule for the n plus first derivative of a product. So what is a kth derivative of a product uv? You have to apply the Leibniz rule. It is k choose j. j derivative is falling on the first factor. k minus j derivative is falling on the second factor, sum over j. So here what happens to this expression when you put x equal to 1 if fewer than n derivatives fall on this then one factor of x minus 1 will survive and that will disappear when you put x equal to 1. If more than n derivatives fall on this factor it will become 0. So the only way you can get a non-zero term is exactly n derivatives fall on the first factor and exactly one derivative falls on the second factor and the corresponding coefficient is n plus 1 choose 1. If n derivatives fall on x minus 1 to the power n, it's going to become n factorial. One derivative falls on this, it will be n times x plus 1 to the power n minus 1. You put x equal to 1. What are you going to get? You're going to get 2 to the power n minus 1 and in the denominator you've got a 2 to the power n and n factorial. The n factorial cancels out. You get 1 half of n into n plus 1 and that's how the formula is to be proved. So here is an application of the Roderick's formula. Now let us prove an important theorem concerning the interlacing of the zeros of the Legendre functions. And this is a very important result. Now you must compare it with the following result. Suppose I take y double prime plus y equal to 0. You know that the solutions are sin x and cos x. The zeros of the sine function and the zeros of the cosine function interlace. Between two zeros of sin x, there's a zero of cos x and vice versa. So this result is of a similar character, a similar genre if you like. So theorem 59. Suppose 0 less than or equal to p less than q and y of x and z of x are respectively solutions of the Legendre equations with parameter p and parameter q. I'm excluding the uninteresting solution, namely the identically zero solution. So I'm taking non-trivial solutions of the Legendre differential equations with parameter p and parameter q. Now I'm looking at two successive zeros of y x there is at least one zero of zx. How do you think about this in general? Now you see, you could compare y double prime plus y equal to zero and take the solution sine x. Or you could look at y double prime plus nine y equal to zero sine three x. Which solution oscillates faster. Obviously sin 3x oscillates faster than sin x. So this differential equation has been written in self-adjoint form. So think of this as the analog of the y double prime term in the sin x example. And think of this p into p plus 1 as some kind of a frequency. So I'm saying p is less than q. So the solutions of this differential equation oscillate with a higher frequency. So you can think of it in this way intuitively if you wish. But the precise mathematical description is stated here. Between two successive zeros of yx, there's a zero of 
zx. So let a and b be successive zeros of yx. Remember that we have already shown that the zeros are isolated. The zeros cannot accumulate. It's a second order differential equation and the zeros cannot accumulate. We'll prove a more general version later. Here you can see it because y of x and z of x are solutions of an analytic differential equation and they are power series solutions and so the, the zeros cannot accumulate anyway. So a and b are successive zeros and I'm going to assume that minus 1 less than a less than b less than 1. We shall imitate the proof of orthogonality of the Legendre polynomials but this time we shall work on the closed interval a b. And multiply the first equation by zx the second equation by yx, integrate over a to b and integration by parts. One integration by parts and we must subtract. So lots of things are going to happen. When you integrate by parts, you are going to pick up boundary terms. When you integrate by parts, the derivative will shift from one term to the other term. What is that going to be? When you multiply the first equation by zx and do a parts, then the derivative will shift from this piece to the zx piece. Over here you are multiplying the differential equation by y and when you in integrate by part the derivative will shift from here to the y. In both these cases you are going to get the term minus integral from a to b 1 minus x squared y prime x z prime x dx and when I subtract the two results this term will cancel out. That's one thing that's going to happen. Another thing that's going to happen is that I'm going to get p into p plus 1 integral from a to b yx zx dx. Here you're going to get integral from a to b q into q plus 1 yx zx dx. When you subtract, you're going to get p into p plus 1 minus q into q plus 1 integral from a to b yx zx dx. That term is surviving. And then there will be the boundary terms when you integrate by parts. Unlike the previous case, these boundary terms will not all vanish because we are not integrating from minus 1 to 1, we are integrating from A to B. Earlier when we did orthogonality of Legendre polynomials, the integration was from minus 1 to 1 and this 1 minus x squared was responsible for the vanishing of the boundary term. So here the boundary terms will survive and these boundary terms have been written out when you integrate by parts. One of these boundary terms has been written in red. Why is it written in red? Because this is the one that's going to cancel out. Y is going to vanish at A and B because A and B are successive zeros of Yx. So this red thing is going to drop out. And what is going to remain? will be 1 minus b squared zb y prime b minus 1 minus a squared za y prime a. And the other term that I talked about, I have not done anything to it, I just written it as it is. Now remember that so far I have not put any conditions on y and z except that a and b are successive zeros of y of x. Now, since a and b are successive zeros, y doesn't vanish in between a and b. So I may assume without loss of generality that y is positive on the open interval a, b. In the other case, if y is everywhere negative, simply work with minus y in place of y, nothing will change. So replacing y by minus y if necessary, I may assume that y of x is positive. Now z of x doesn't vanish in a, b that we make an assumption that is we prove it by contradiction and we'll try to arrive at a contradiction. We shall assume that z of x is non-vanishing in the interval a, b. Again replacing z by minus z if necessary, I may assume that z of x is always positive on a, b and we will arrive at a contradiction. With this z of a is positive, z of b is positive y of a is 0, y of b is 0 and y is positive which means the function y is increasing at a because it from 0 it is becoming positive 
and it is decreasing at B because from positive it has become 0. So y prime of A must be greater than or equal to 0 and y prime of B must be less than or equal to 0. So y prime of B is less than or equal to 0, z of B is positive, 1 minus B squared is positive. y prime of A is non-negative, so this piece is also negative. So this is negative or 0, this piece is negative or 0. y of x and z of x are both positive in the interval a, b. So this integral is positive and this number p into p plus 1 minus q into q plus 1 is negative because p is strictly less than q. So 0 or negative, 0 or negative, strictly negative and the sum is 0 and that's a contradiction. So we have proved the theorem. Okay, so this is what, what I said has been summarized in this slide and here is a little exercise for you. Can it happen that y of x and z of x have a common zero? Please read this proof very carefully and try to rule out a case that y of x and z of x have a common zero. Another important exercise, try to prove that if zero less than or equal to p less than q, then between two successive zeros of jpx, there is a zero of jqx. Try to prove a similar result for the Bessel's functions, zeros of the Bessel's function. Given a sequence an of real or complex numbers, the generating function is by definition the power series summation n from 0 to infinity a n t to the power n. Now the theorem 60 says summation n from 0 to infinity t to the power n p n x equal to 1 upon root of 1 minus 2 x t plus t squared. That is a generating function for the sequence of Legendre polynomial can be written in closed form. Now this result is extremely important in classical potential theory. For a connection between classical potential theory, see for example this book of Ramsey, Newtonian Attraction, Cambridge University Press, page 131 and following or page 121 to 134 or the more comprehensive and classic treatise of Oliver Diamond Kellogg foundations of potential theory Dover 1953. Both these references are being given. The Kellogg's reference is very classical and a very important reference in the potential theory. So we want to prove this theorem 60. So let's complete the proof of this. Remember this must be compared to the generating function for the sequence of Bessel's functions. There are several proofs of this important theorem and we select the one from Courant and Hilbert's monumental treatise, Methods of Mathematical Physics, Volume 1. Only a sketch of proof will be provided. The details can be worked out easily. Some details will be slightly cumbersome, an integral computation for instance, but you can do it. Exercise 11 in the previous slide tells you that if you take this function 1 minus 2xt plus t squared, so it is 1 plus some something t squared minus 2xt. That something is small in absolute value. So I can apply the binomial series. 1 plus z to the power a can be written as a binomial series. So when you write this as a binomial series, that series will converge absolutely when the mod t squared minus 2xt is less than 1. So the series converges absolutely. You can rearrange the terms in such a way that I can collect the powers of t and I can write this sum function vxt as summation n from 0 to infinity rnx t to the power n where rnx is obviously going to be a polynomial of degree exactly n. When you write this expansion using the binomial series, you will have to tell me why is this a polynomial of degree exactly n. And the series is valid for x between minus 1 and 1 provided mod t is small. In fact, if mod t is less than 0.4, that will be enough for carrying out the analysis. So now let's do the following. Let us now use the fundamental orthogonality lemma that's going to play a role. So let us first write down 
the expression for the potential V of x t with two different parameters t equal to u and t equal to v and let us multiply the two series. When you multiply the two series you will get summation j from 0 to infinity, summation k from 0 to infinity r j x r k x u to the power j v to the power k. Remember that the Cauchy product of two absolutely convergent series will absolutely converge. So, I can assume that mod u is less than 0 0.4, mod v is less than 0 0.4, there is no harm in doing that. Now, what happens? I am going to integrate both sides with respect to x in the range minus 1, 1. And I am going to get 1 upon root uv ln 1 plus root uv upon 1 minus root uv. That is the tedious part. You will have to integrate the left hand side with respect to x. Remember it is an integral with respect to x. It is an elementary integral but a tedious integral. I am sure you can do it. On the right hand side you are going to be get a double summation u to the power j v to the power k integral minus 1 to 1 r j x r k x dx. Now you will ask how can I take the integration under the summation sign? You want uniform convergence. Remember that term by term integration is perfectly fine if you know that the series converges uniformly. My u and the v were, were restricted to be less than 0.4 in absolute value. You can make it even smaller and you can guarantee uniform convergence for all x in the range minus 1, 1 and the integration can be taken under the summation sign. So now left hand side you got a nice function which can be written as a power series ln 1 plus z. What is ln of 1 plus z? It is z minus z squared upon 2 plus z cube upon 3 minus z to the power 4 upon 4 da da da. And you got ln of 1 minus z. What is ln of 1 minus z? Minus z minus z squared upon 2 minus z cube upon 3 minus da da da. Both these expansions are valid for mod z less than 1. Remember my, my u and the v are going to be pretty small in absolute value. So there is no problem. And then you write the difference ln of 1 plus root uv minus ln of 1 minus root uv and then you divide by 1 upon root uv. Okay. So the logarithmic series we have got to be used and we are going to get summation n from 0 to infinity 2 times u to the power n v to the power n upon 2n plus 1. So both sides are double power series in uv. So compare the coefficients of u to the power j v to the power k on both sides. What happens? You see in the left hand side the u to the power j v to the power k only appears when j and k are equal. right? So we immediately get that integral minus 1 to 1 rjx rkx dx is 0 if j is not equal to k whereas if j is equal to k integral minus 1 to 1 rjx the whole square dx is 2 upon 2j plus 1. Lo and behold rjx is a polynomial of degree exactly j. Now you can apply the fundamental lemma to the sequence r0x, r1x, r2x dot 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 and we get that rjx will be a multiple of pjx. How is it that I have written that this constant of proportionality is 1 directly? The norms of the both these things are 1. Remember that norm pj squared is 2 upon 2j plus 1. We did the norm calculation in the last capsule. So, the constant of proportionality has to be plus 1 or minus 1. You can figure out that it will be 1 by looking at the leading coefficient or something. And so that completes the argument that the Legendre polynomials has generating function 1 upon root 1 minus 2xt plus t squared. Because I just expanded this and I found out that the coefficients r and x are exactly the Legendre polynomials p and x. Okay, so one final comment, this function v of xt is a potential due to a point mass p placed at unit distance from the origin at a point x, the potential at x which is at a distance of t from the origin.
and x is the cosine of the angle between ox and op so this has a physical interpretation and i think with this that completes the section on generating functions couple of exercises for you and an expansion uh, which is which involves both the bessel's function and the legendre polynomials so let us call it the fourier bessel expansion rather than state the theorems on fourier legendre series you can consult the classic books that are cited so far here we'll look at an example which is due to lord rayleigh theory of sound volume 2 page 273 e to the power i t x equal to summation n from 0 to infinity 2n plus 1 i to the power n root pi by 2t j n plus half t p n x prove a induction first before you embark upon this expansion prove that j n plus half t equal to 1 upon root pi n factorial t by 2 to the power half plus n integral minus 1 to 1 1 minus x square to the power n cos t x d x how do you prove this first write down the power series for jpt where p is any non negative real number for example put p equal to half put p equal to half find out what is j half of t you will get a very familiar looking series a sin series it won't be sin x it will be slight variant thereof and then try to differentiate and check you have the relation between jp prime jp plus 1 and jp minus 1 remember and try to use induction to prove this and this and formally deduce the result of lord rayleigh now this expansion appears in scattering theory problems on scattering of plane waves by spherical obstacles i think i'll close this capsule here thank you very much